just, can you just shift right into the score from the Lakers-Boston game? Can you make that shift very quickly? If you can, it, it just might mean that your mind runs a million miles an hour, like mine does. But if you find that you're waiting for Sabbath to get done, and you're disappointed when the Sabbath is coming, and you're not looking forward to sitting in class, and you can very easily talk about Facebook and um, literature and sports and the weather, but find a more difficult time talking about spiritual things, it might be that you are not a spiritual person. Does that make sense? And so some things, a very good personal, the, the Bible says examine yourselves whether or not you be in the faith or no. It's a very good personal evaluative tool to figure out, am I the person that I want to be and that, that I want others to think of me as? Am I perceived as a spiritual person? Okay, not just perceived, but are you actually a spiritual person? And then a great modification of a St. Francis of Assisi quote, unless you preach everywhere you go, there is no use going anywhere to preach. Unless you preach everywhere you go, there's no use going anywhere to preach. I think it was Mark Finley who said, most people want to be missionaries where they aren't, not where they are. So this is why we take mission trips. And we go to the Philippines to preach. And praise the Lord. I'm happy you went to the Philippines to preach. And you went to South Africa to preach. Hey, praise the Lord. I'm glad you went to Africa to preach or South Africa. And you went to, to Papua New Guinea. Hey, I'm happy you went to Papua New Guinea to preach. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, there's a whole lot right with it. There's a whole lot right with it. Many people have found their spiritual experience radically enhanced and revitalized by going somewhere to preach because they see the power of the word, they see the passion, etc. But if you find a consistent experience is that you can be a very spiritual person when you are not at home, that's a danger sign for you. If it's very easy to be spiritual in the Philippines for two weeks, and it's very easy to be spiritual in Africa for two weeks, and it's very easy to be spiritual in Papua New Guinea for two or three weeks, are you that same person when you're back home? If you are going somewhere to be spiritual, if you are going somewhere to be a missionary, this ought to be a red flag for you. Make sense? That's what a sissy is saying here. Unless you find that you are preaching everywhere you go, that preaching and ministry and missionary work is a part of your life here in the good old U.S. of A. or wherever it is that you make your residence, if, if that's not the case, then why should you be willing to travel or why should you desire to travel somewhere else so that you can be a missionary where you aren't? You don't live in the Philippines. Now, if you were a missionary in your home, in your university, in your school, if you were a, a missionary in your neighborhood, then it's totally, completely appropriate to want to also preach to every single person on earth. I think it was John Wesley after his conversion. He said, I consider the whole world to be my parish. I consider the whole world to be my parish. So wherever I go, I preach. They're all, the whole world is my parish. That's kind of how he saw himself. And that's very appropriate and very admirable. And it's very appropriate and admirable for you, right? But if you find that you think, man, I'm going to go somewhere so I can preach over there to be a missionary, to be a minister, but then that same passion, that same compulsion in your soul, in your guts, that fire in your bones is not taking place when you're at 23234 Granger Road in Oxford, Michigan or whatever it is, you got problems. Unless you preach everywhere you go, what's the use of going anywhere to preach? Make sense? So D, you're going to go to Haiti, you're going to be a missionary. Great. Go to Haiti and be a missionary for a time, but just make sure you're a missionary here because this is where you are. What does the Bible say? Whatever your hand finds to do, what? Do it with all your might. Even Jesus said you will be witnesses. This is Acts chapter 1. Jesus said you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Start where you're at. And then you can, in concentric circles, circle-wise manner, make your way out. Nothing wrong with being a missionary out here. But just make sure you're a missionary here as well. And here, and here, and here. Okay? Don't aspire to be a missionary where you aren't. Aspire to be a missionary where you are. And if you are a missionary, as we've said before, every trip you make is a mission trip. If you're a missionary, every trip you make is a mission trip. Okay? Chris was just saying, I said, hey, Chris, your hair looks good. And it does look very good, by the way. He's, and then his wife said, oh, he got a haircut because of... Because of his, or he got, a, he got a Bible study because of his haircut. Is that right? Did I get that right? So I just thought it looked so good somebody walked up to you on the street and said, oh man, your hair looks good. Will you study the Bible with me? No. <laughs> but it was his hairdresser. So that's a, that's a mission trip. You go to sit down in a chair, that's a mission trip. You go to buy groceries, that's a mission trip. Nothing wrong with going to the Philippines to preach your guts out, okay? But just be sure that you're also on a mission trip when you're at the grocery store or when you're getting your oil changed or whatever it is. So far so good, everyone? Okay, a couple more here. All of the great preachers, the people that we think of as, as great, uh, th the people that we think of as great preachers, people like Dwight Moody and others, uh, Billy Graham, these, these people that were great preachers, the C.H. Spurgeons of the world, 
They were all first and foremost great Christians. And their preaching ministry flowed naturally and necessarily from a dynamic and genuine relationship with their Lord. That's just summarizing what we've been saying. You can profess Christ without possessing Christ. That is possible, like the man that we talked about there in the pulpit. The man who was acting inappropriately with the ladies, but when he was standing up to preach, hundreds and thousands were coming to his meetings and being blessed and converted. So he can profess Christ without possessing Christ. But the converse is not true. You cannot possess Christ in your innermost soul without professing him. Does everyone follow that? Okay, it is possible to say lots of nice, nice things about Jesus but not have a living connection with him. But it is not possible to have a living connection with Jesus and not talk about him. That is not possible. Amen. Okay, so the messenger's commitment. First and foremost, sorry, I'll come back that up. First and foremost, we strive to be great Christians, great followers of the Christ. And secondarily to that, subsidiary to that, we also can desire to be great communicators of the message, whether it's to one or 100 or 1,000. Ellen White says that Jesus had a faithful regard for the one soul audience. Jesus had a faithful regard for the one soul audience. In other words, for Jesus, it didn't matter if he was preaching to 100 or 1,000. In fact, very interestingly, in passages like Luke 9 and others, um, Luke 14 comes to mind, Luke 9 especially though, you know, thousands of people are following Jesus, and Jesus turns around and practically tries to discourage them. He's like, hey, what are you doing? What, what, what are you? The Bible says, and seeing great multitudes following him, he said. <laughs> and he basically says to them, what are you following me for? Birds have nests, and foxes have dens, but I don't even have a place to sleep, man. I don't know where I'm staying tonight. What are you following me for? Unless you hate your father and your mother, what are you doing? What do you, it's very interesting. We often find Jesus not trying to gather great crowds, but almost distancing himself from great crowds. Because the truth of the matter is, is Jesus understood what we would today call mob mentality. That many people, when they get in a situation, will just do what everybody else is doing precisely because everybody else is doing it. And there's safety in numbers. I was at a camp meeting not too long ago, and there was a gentleman who was preaching. And... Uh, he preached and he was talking about music. He just made a commentary about music and he was saying, you know, um, something on the more liberal side of the spectrum about music. About, I think he said something like, if only the saints like your music, there's something wrong with it. And, and he was sort of coming to music from the slightly left side of the equation. And the, the camp meeting just broke out in applause. <laughs> woo! 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 Well, he preached the morning meeting and then I was, I was there. I, I heard the sermon. It was a fine sermon. But he just threw in this little jab, which was fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, I guess. So then uh, that evening, as, as fate would have it, in my particular sermon, um, not planned, not sort of uh, um, anticipated, I ended up making a comment about music that basically said, you know, just because we label something Christian doesn't make it Christian. You know, Christian pornography is not legit. Christian marijuana is not legit. Oh, hey, come on. You want to smoke some Christian marijuana with me? It's really good. The, the, the fellow prays over his fields and he pays tithe on his, his uh, 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 money that he earns from marijuana. And uh, yeah, 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 like it, come and smoke this Christian marijuana with me and we'll look at some Christian pornography together. You would say, are you, are you, what? No, 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 all of these porn stars are Christians. Like they pray before they go on stage. And you'd be, what, what are you talking about? Those two things don't go together. So I had made a variation of this and I'd said, you know, just because music claims to be Christian doesn't mean it's Christian. You can say Christian music but, but the question is, is, what kind of music are we talking about? We can say rock and roll, but just adding the word Christian in front of the word rock and roll doesn't make it Christian any more than Christian marijuana or Christian pornography. And guess what the, guess what the congregation did? Woo! 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 And praise the Lord, God gave me the courage and the boldness to stop and say, are you kidding? Are you kidding? Not even 12 hours ago, somebody else said something quite the opposite of what I've just said, and you clapped just the same way that you've clapped for me. I said, don't clap or cheer just because the person sitting next to you is clapping and cheering. Don't say amen just because the person sitting next to you is, and man, it was just like, shoop. <laughs> Fortunately, I got invited back. But the point was, <laughs> the point is this. Don't miss this point that, that Jesus often tried to distance himself from crowds because Jesus knew that the quality of decision made in a crowd cannot even begin to compare to the quality of decision when somebody is by themselves or with a smaller group. So we often think, 
Oh man, if I could just preach to hundreds and thousands. No, 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 no. The truth of the matter is, is that some of your most powerful and effective sermons will be to smaller groups of people because the accountability and the not just getting carried away with the mob mentality takes place in smaller groups. Does that make sense? You with me on that? I'll tell you a great little story. Um, and I might have already told you. Did I tell you the story about Josh Cunningham, the musician, and how, he, how it is he came to arise? No. I didn't tell you this story? Okay, well, this just goes to show you how God can choose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise and how God can do great things through mighty things. The Bible says, and I think it's Zechariah chapter 4, who has despised the day of small things? I love that. Who has despised the day of small things? Like, like God can do great things through small things, and he often does there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he's chosen the foolish things to confound the wise and the simple things to confound the sophisticated. So, so I'm, I get to Australia. I can't believe I haven't told you this story. I get to Australia, and they're presenting this meeting put on by me called The Turning Point. And in this particular meeting, there's just been miscommunication and I hadn't been able to stay in good touch with the people and it was probably my fault or I don't know, it was probably both of ours. And so when I finally get there and I see the brochure, the brochure is just a great big picture of my head. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like my head but cut off above my hairline so I look like a great big bald alien <laughs> with like a smile like, and it says the turning point. There's nothing on the, there's nothing on there that indicates what this is about, that it's Christian, that it's nothing. And it's, I think it was conducted at what's called the Sydney Enter Enter Entertainment Center or something like that. Anyway, downtown Sydney, big venue. And it makes it sound like it's this big deal. And here's these pictures of me, like big posters like this, you know, plastered up all over my head, you know, the size of a, you know, the size of a 55 gallon drum, you know, and the turning point. I mean, I said to a friend of mine, I said, man, people are probably, I mean, people are going to look at this thing and think, I wonder what that means. Did this guy become gay and this is like his story? <laughs> like, because he, he had no idea. There was just like no indication of what it was. It was like a great, like this funny looking guy and the turning point. So anyway, when I get there, I'm like, no, no, and there's brochures everywhere. And it's like Cindy, Sydney Entertainment Center with David Ashrick. And we ended up having a room like smaller than this, about this size in, the, in this huge venue. So people are, it looks like it's this big thing. And we get there, and the, the screen, this thing, is just this size, exactly. But it's like all rickety. It's like hanging off like that. And, and the lights are like flickering, about like that. <laughs> and uh, oh, it was just, the, so I get there, and this thing that looks so big and advertising, and there's about 120 people there, maybe. Yeah, probably 120. And there's no stage, no platform. These just institutionally terrible lights in this terrible room, all brick sides, and just bad acoustics, and we had this rinky-dink little sound system. Oh, it was a disaster. I can't even, oh, I just, uh, uh, thinking about it. So I stand up and I preach, but all I can think about is the lights, the flickering lights, and this thing, and the walls, and how this was, you know, advertised as this great big thing, and, and I just preached, and I don't even remember what I said, probably, who even knows, but anyway, I survived. I went home to my wife. She said, oh, how was the meeting tonight? Because she didn't come home that night, because we'd had jet lag. She didn't come to the meeting. And I said, oh, it was a disaster, <laughs> just a disaster. And she's like, oh, really? So I said, I'll give it another night. So I went back the next night. It's supposed to be a week-long series of meetings. Went back the next night, similarly disastrous, except now there's only like 80 people there because probably half of the people showed up, thought I was going to talk about who knows. And I ended up preaching on, on Christ. And so, you know, our audience has gone down. The lights are still flickering. The screen is still tilted. And it's just, it's not looking good. And I'm supposed to do this every night for like, eight nights. So I say to my wife that night, I said, I, I'm, I'm canceling this meeting. I am canceling this meeting for sure because 